I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh within us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. 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 That beautiful prayer of St. Paul for the church. And if you want to know where in the Holy Bible that is, it's in Ephesians chapter 3. Okay. Good evening, everybody. This is our last session in this beautiful uh, study that our Archbishop of Berkey has been guide leading us through. This is our last session before we come to Holy and Great Week next week and live through the uh, annual memorial of the Passion and Resurrection of the Savior, the Christian Passover, the Christian Pascha. Um, we didn't get quite to halfway in the book, actually, page 70, yeah, so about halfway. As a matter of fact, exactly halfway. So we did get halfway. Um, so now we're looking at the awakening, reawakening of the conscience. And last week and the week before, we, and the week before that, we spent quite a bit of time listening to what the Archbishop had to say um, in his teaching about evangelical love versus fake love, right? Human uh, or self-centered love. So what are some things that we learned from that? I, I would like you just to, to lubricate us moving into this next one with a, a kind of a uh, inventory of the kinds of things that you were struck with, or struck by in that teaching on evangelical love. It can be a word, a sentence, a proposition, something that I will make some notes based on what you said. I would start with uh, only through love of Christ can we love. Uh, okay, so we're not talking about just any old love. Is that, is that what your point is? Yeah. Is there okay. a chapter three? Five, I think. Of Christ, all right? Not just any old love, but the love which Christ demonstrates and has for us and which he gives through his Holy Spirit to us. Would that be right? Yeah. Our own love without Christ is self-seeking or, uh, I don't know, it has a selfish aspect, a self-pleasing side of us, even though we hide it under the guise of love of the other person. Okay. One who has this love of Christ follows the commandments. Mm, you're going to. Oh, yes. <laughs> I got yelled at. I got yelled at by a teacher once. Mm -hmm. Somebody else speak. What other? What other uh, insights came through to you that you are finding yourself dwelling on from that teaching of love? It has to do with where we're going tonight, because if we, this chapter tonight won't make any sense if we don't kind of hook them together like on a train, and one pulls the other. We have to figure out how that's going to work. So we become what we are not through suffering? Say more what you mean by that. To be exalted through his love, we need faith in Christ. Oh, these are the criteria for love of Christ. Yeah. Is that it? 
There are criteria for the love of Christ. Okay. You have to have faith that Christ is the Son of Man. For, for uh, I'll put uh, gospel love instead of the big long word evangelical. Okay, gospel love. Uh, what did you say? Faith? Faith. In Christ, right. the in, God. Uh, if I do XC with a little squiggle, that's abbreviation for Christ. Okay. What is the next one? Well, you have to believe that he's the son of God. You have to believe yeah. that he is who he says he is. The son of God. Because lots of people believe in Christ, but yeah. they have different definitions. And then um, God is creator. Okay. And that he's merciful. Okay. Okay. What else? Um, These criteria we went over, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, we must avoid temptation um, through uh, rootedness in the teaching of the church. Okay, so, so faith, Christ the Son of God, God is creator and merciful, the saving passion of Christ. Right. That's why we give Holy Week so much attention. And then um, the temptation of enthusiasm. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so if you realize your, your salvation without that enthusiasm and emotionalism. Yes. And then um, there's a rootedness in the gospel. There we go. The Holy yes. Scriptures, especially the gospel, and being obedient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are all criteria to love God. If that's working in you, then that's the kind of life I'm living, right? It should bring you to that. Yeah. It's your roadmap. Anything else? Okay. The, this is important because it's setting up what we're, where we're going, why he has this next chapter. How do we get from uh, evangelical love to reawakening the conscience? So I think probably the best plan. Oh, I think I think he said somewhere in the past two that's me. Hi, <laughs> your, your ventriloquism. <laughs> <laughs> so in the past, uh, somewhere in the past two chapters, he was saying that it is as this kind of bridal love that you are just so focused <coughs> on the one that you love, and you're just so sensitive that to anything that hurts him or or anything that just comes in the way of your relationship. And I think that's what um, that's what mm -hmm. the conscience I'm gonna put a star here because Dolly is getting a little golden star. Mm -hmm. All right. Um a love of God um, is sensitive to the to the beloved. <laughs> Um, God is the both the lover and he's also the beloved because this is an interpersonal relationship. God didn't make us robots. He didn't just say, oh, I love you. Would you all please respond? Yes, God. Oh, that's very nice of you. No, this is much more profound. So when God loves us, he's the lover of mankind. Philanthropos, remember that beautiful word? God is, that's one of his titles. He is philanthropos. Now that's your $50 Greek word for the day. All right? And um, this philanthropic love for God is completely free of ego. And God does not have an ego. There is no I with God. He loves us utterly and completely, pouring himself out for us. And this is evident um, at the high point, the climax of the passion, when he's completely exposed to the cosmos, and every demon and every evil power attacked him, right? And he just, he just absorbed all of it and killed it out of love for us. It's a stunning thing to see. This is no moral, um, I feel sorry for Jesus because he had to die for me type thing. It is the death of evil. It is the victory over sin and death and everything dark and ugly. 
and he absorbed it all into his flesh, his rent flesh, and killed death, mortified death, right? That's the love of God, right? All right. That shows that God is the lover, and we're the beloved, and he's inviting us into a kind of a relationship where we will be the lover and he will be the beloved as well. Right? <coughs> so there's an exchange that happens in love, doesn't it? Isn't there? Well, what Dahlia said a moment ago is very interesting because in order for this to take place, there has to be a sensitivity. There has to be some part, some faculty of our being that actually can <coughs> take those impressions and register them with us. And what is that faculty of our being that would register and make an impression on us regarding God's overtures towards us? Where in our being are we going to get that? Are we going to get that in our, um, like our eyesight, our ears, our Lots of touch? Lots of We're going to get that through this faculty which is called the conscience, okay? So put the word conscience here, and you know me, I love words. So can we do a little parsing of this word? Like what, what have we got here? It's a very beautiful Latin word. Right. With knowledge. Yeah. So what, what are the two parts? So we have con, and what does this mean? With. Okay. All right. And then, what's that other word? Now I took the con out of it. How do you? Science. Science. Knowledge. Not the science is knowledge, but science is a, a certain kind of knowledge. Now you wouldn't know this, but in the English language, uh, we got this word from Latin. And it's a good word that we got it from. The, the word for German, which is the other half of our languages, for conscience is Gewissen, which simply means, I'll put it over here for those of you that you want to speak German on the side. All right. Uh, Wissen is like your, your wits. You know, the word wits or wit, that means knowledge in Anglo-Saxon. So Gewissen is knowledge. So it's a very simple word. It is the German word for conscience. So the emphasis is on knowledge, but it's not on just any old kind of knowledge. It's a very, it's a very uh, concrete word. It goes back to ancient Latin. Uh, this kind of knowing is what we have, what we actually experience. Not mystical knowing, not direct intuition, but the knowledge we get from experience. Experiential knowledge is scientia in Latin, or science. Right? <clears throat> we know this from the scientific method. That's why it's called the scientific method, because it's knowledge gained from experimentation. I do A, and then I watch the result, and I get uh, some result from that, and then I extrapolate from A and say, okay, well, this is what I can learn from this. this is, every time I buy two apples, I have to pay twice the price as one. That means two, one plus one equals two. It's like, Every time, it seems like, you know. Um, so the faculty in our soul that is called conscience is the part in us that gains knowledge and shares it with me. It shares it with me. This faculty inside of me informs me about what I'm learning. Right? So I'm, I'm a little kid. I'm at home, and I'm playing with my mother's uh, jewelry. The jewelry box, I got it open and all the jewels out on the floor. And I'm playing around and flipping them around, next thing I know, I break one. My little schizia inside of me is saying, you're a bad boy. You know you shouldn't have broken that. Mm -hmm. And I just feel bad. So what do I do? I go find the broken thing and I kind of like collect it and put it in a little, I don't know, a little cup that I think, think somehow will hide it. And then I put everything back, put the jewel back, and, said, and then mom comes home and I said, 
I didn't do anything bad today. <laughs> Why did I do that? Because I have a conscience, and my conscience is, it's little beepers going off, right? My conscience is inflamed, and my conscience keeps telling me that I'm a bad boy. And no amount of dickering with my conscience will make it stop doing that. This is why we're talking about this now, because it's the conscience which will register whether our love of God is on track or not. It's the most important fu function of the conscience. I can say I love God, but if my conscience is bothering me, then as a test as I, I know. And people do dreadful things to try to silence their conscience. And a sure sign that a person is listening to their conscience is when they cry out to God and admit their sins and faults. And that little kid that took the jewelry said, Mommy, I broke something. Well, what did you break? Something. <laughs> well, show it to me. And then he brings the cup and shows it to Mommy. And Mommy looks at it and says, That's my $75,000. Uh, but the tenderness of the little child's conscience is such that the parent says, okay, my dear, we'll figure this out. Because what do you do when someone's obeying their conscience? So the conscience is, the, is this, it's what we're dealing with tonight. Um, the Greek word for conscience has a, a, even a more a beautiful edge to it. Actually, it, mean, it is also has the with part, but the part of the middle instead of knowledge is seeing. It's like you see inside of you the right and the wrong. And it's that vision, that in, inner vision, that inner eye that's looking at you. The Greeks love vision, anything seeing. That's why the icons with the eyes are so interesting. The Egyptians have the best eyes in the world. Um, and they, the Greeks were fascinated by that, so they tried to emulate the, the Egyptians. And um, uh, uh, this seeing within myself, uh, I see it a certain way, may not admit it to myself, but I see it a certain way. That seeing and knowing are, are really the same kind of thing. Okay. Um, so, this is the, the subject of our, of our chapter tonight. Now, the title is Reawakening Our Conscience. And the Archbishop, uh, if you read pages 61 through 70, and you can see what he's teaching on this. So, a couple of questions. If the conscience is reawake, it needing to be reawakened, what happened to it? It was dormant. Like, what is this dormancy? And how did it get there? Uh, how did it happen that it's dormant? Could, any of you that read the chapter, can you pull out something on that, that point? He initiates the chapter by talking about the culture that we live in. Is that what? Yes, okay. And um, how through our uh, egotism and our moral decay we have, and our psychology, we have uh, completely done away with the need for a conscience. Mm -hmm. Explain the And uh, um, scientists even go so far as to say it's an antiquated concept mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and man the new man god has outgrown his need for a conscience so page 61 and also page 67 uh, middle of page 67 <coughs> scientific theories to explain the conscience have now appeared scientific theories to explain it. Are those of you who studied psychology, say, in the university, or there, can you think of a school of psychology that's particularly uh, corrosive in this respect? Behaviorism. Behaviorism. Perfect. Behaviorism. 
So what does behavioralism, the school of psychology, what does it actually teach? Everything is conditioned and response. It's all stimulus and response. We're just animals. We, we just do what it works. And the argument there is um, sci scientists like he means behavioralism. <coughs> claim that the conscience is a complex of emotional phenomena with no divine component. It is founded on the basic instinct for self-preservation. So I'm going to do what furthers my existence, right? And simply dictates what a person should do to prevent harm to himself and his earthly life. And he goes on to show that that's patently false. It doesn't explain a lot of human behavior, which is frankly selfless. Uh, how do you explain that? Um, in the very first, Christina said at the beginning, he's uh, showing how the idea of conscience is an archaic notion. Um, and uh, speaking about how people behave as though there were no conscience. And he counters the argument that people say he's exaggerating or being too negative by giving some examples. So a lot of material in this chapter is proving that the conscience is actually a, a thing. It's actually a faculty of the soul. It's not just a response to something. So next question. Which is higher? Which is more noble? The conscience or the mind? I don't mean the brain. I mean the noose, the mind. The higher mind. So which is higher? The, the conscience or the news? When I say news, do you know what I mean by that? No. I'm not talking about the brain which processes scientific or experiential data. Like with the brain, we take in whatever the senses give us, right? They deliver their sensory impressions to us. But the senses themselves don't tell us anything. We have to, we have to translate those sensory impulses into something. And that's what we do in our brain. That's not what I'm talking about when I say the mind. I'm talking about the deeper part of us, the reflective part of us, the part of us that sees ourselves. This is the way I love uh, Augustine was right on this. He says that the mind is the part of us that sees ourself knowing. Like you can know a thing, but then when you notice yourself knowing, that's a higher level thing. Well, which is higher there? That, so one might the mind, the news, or the conscience? The conscience. The conscience. Yeah. All the fathers talk about the news. You're going to say the news. Okay, the subdeacon is putting his lot in with yeah. the news. I've never read the chapter. <laughs> and there goes the arch reader, also said it's the. Uh, We've got two consciences, though. It's tied to the two. Both and I are on the conscience. Yes. <laughs> Hope and, and, and Gabi. Gabi on the All right, so far it's two to two. How many say that the higher part of our being is the news? Okay, how many say it's the conscience? Oh, no. you guys are <laughs> cheating. How many didn't do their homework? <laughs> how many? I didn't do my homework. I'm still going. Yeah. Still siding with the fathers. <laughs> I have a question. What, what about consciousness? You get me conscious. Get me conscious. No, we're not talking about uh, consciousness. We're talking about conscience. Yes, I know that. Totally different thing. Okay. Consciousness is just meaning I'm aware of myself sensing. Uh, if I if I knock you out with my fist, knock you to the floor, and knock you out. But is that the news? You're not. You're unconscious. There's nothing to do with whether your conscience is working. Yes. I, my conscience will be working really hard telling me what a bad thing I did to knock me down. Okay. Um, my wife has voted with me. The uh, a <laughs> university <laughs> graduate has pulled a kind of a call for the question. <laughs> okay, how many say that the higher faculty is the conscience? How many say the higher faculty is the news? Ooh, it's outweighing. Okay, well, I'm here to tell you 
that the conscience is higher. Well, why though? I mean, it, never, it doesn't lie. And your yeah. news is the one that decides if you're going to listen to the conscience or not. Yes. Ah. Uh, so you you get train your news. Now, Sydney gets the gold. The conscience <laughs> is infallible. Oh, well, now I have a question. Now, now you've sparked a question. Because isn't this exactly what Mark was saying? No. That I, that I yeah. mean, I, unless my conscience dictates. Yeah, but. Okay, if I was speaking in German, he would say, problem. he would say, ich kann nicht anders. I can't do anything else. Um, I have to do what I have a conviction to do. Uh, it's a denial of the Catholicity of the church. Right. It's a break from the Catholicity. Yeah, well, what, first he, he said, I have to take a vow and be a monk. And then he said, I'm not going to be a monk anymore. Right. So the, the, it's all in the eye. It's an ego thing. Martin Luther is... Seriously flawed in this regard. And then how okay. yeah. Anyway, but conscience does not mean I believe that this is the right course of action and that's the wrong course of action. Like publicly, I put it out there. I could be wrong and misjudging. I may not have the right data. I may not understand the situation. Like when we look at the Ukraine war thing that's going on now. I've talked to people that give me insights to that that I'm not used to because I never hear them. Nobody talks in the media about them. They only talk about Russian bad and West is good. You know, so it's all I ever hear. But I hear people that come from another part of the world that say, just hold on to all darn moment here. There are other things going on there. So that's not an issue of conscience. That's an issue of needing more scientia. I need more data because I really don't understand the situation. Um, so what we're dealing with is conscience in its narrowly constructed sense is the faculty of the soul that tells the difference between right and wrong. Right? The law, it's what Paul meant when he said that the law of God is written in our hearts. Romans chapter 1. Okay? And 2. Um, and that those who do not have the tradition but they obey the law written in their hearts are already on a path toward justification with God. Okay, right? uh, this is the question I want to pose. Okay. Do we train the conscience, or are we born with the conscience uh, that knows intuitively what is pleasing to God and what is displeasing, or what is All right? right let's, and take, what is let's take what Berkey says here. Um, I mean, I know you can dull the conscience and Page silence. 65. Let's go to page 65. Um, one cannot, no matter how immoral contemporary mankind has become, one cannot say that its conscience has totally managed. One can stifle it, scorn it, pretend that it's not there, but one cannot eliminate it completely. And then go down six lines. God's voice will not be silenced. So the conscience is the faculty in our soul through which God speaks to us. That's how we know the difference between right and wrong. And so that's why so many fathers have talked about cleansing the noose so then it can flow properly. Yes, because the con and a conscience is in valuable for that. That's the only way I can participate in the cleansing of the filth of the eye of my mind so that I can remember the noose is the mind seeing what it knows. Well, if that eye is filthy, then the whole body is full of light. Jesus said that. If your eye be healthy, not eyes, if your eye be healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye be evil, then you're full of darkness. And how great is that darkness? So the eye is the conscience? Well, I, thought the eye, I thought that verse is always used 
in describing the news. It is. Okay. It is. And that's what Christina just now uttered at the same time you did. Okay. Yes, it's talking about the news. The news is the eye of the soul. But the conscience is the way that that eye receives its light and is alerted properly. Like it's, uh, if you will, it's the connector that links the voice of God with our news. It's the only way we can know the difference between right and wrong is through the conscience. God speaks to our conscience. And then, as Jacob just now pointed out, if that con if we're aware, our conscience is alerted, it's, it's waking up. It's like, ouch. I feel that I feel the pinch of that. That's what we call compunction or contrition. Um, by the way, all the hymns of the church, um, in, the, in the language of the church, they're called compunctionate hymns because their role is, is uh, therapeutically is to nick uh, our conscience so that it will be awakened and it will be it'll it'll react and it will say, "God help me, I'm on my way to hell. I've got to stop living like this." Right? Remember when Peter was in the boat with Jesus when they first started the ministry? Mm -hmm. And Jesus was preaching. His heart was nicked. It's like this, I love that little word. It, it means to take a, a little, a little tiny of a sharp hook and just kind of go like that. You, yeah, it makes you jump. It's like, well, that's what that's what the uh, the divine word, that's what the word of God does when it comes to us, and that is the conscience that's being awakened, which lent, which lead, leads to the opening of the eye of our mind, of our soul, we begin to see differently. And that's what repentance is. Repentance is that process of the conscience being nicked, which alerts all the other faculties, starting with the news, because that's the heart, that's the altar of our being. That's the inner part where the major transaction between God and all created order in man takes place. That's where the grand meeting place between eternity and creation is, is in the noose, the heart, the deep heart. And the conscience is what wakes that up. So that is infallible. Once the conscience is awakened and functioning, we have a sure guide. The church teaches firmly about this and trusts that those who are walking according to God, that are walking in the Spirit, that is to say, they're at peace with God, their conscience is working, they never have to worry about anything as long as they obey the dictates of their conscience. That's why the church has confession, spiritual counsel, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, holy scripture, we're constantly getting all of this this um, um, compunctionate material to lead us in the proper orientation of our conscience so that it functions properly. Okay. So, question. Yeah. Um, like in Catholic school, we talked about like an actual, like, like there was this concept of a malformed conscience yes. that we want to form our consciousness rightly. But in this, the way that we're talking about it here, it would be like, in, in those times when we do make grievous mistakes or yeah. misjudgments, it's because we are putting, like, we're mistaking our eye and, like, our own, like, wants and uh, okay, our, our own, like, worldly desires a, before our conscience. I was raised our, Roman Catholic, so I remember okay. the Jesuits taught us that you have to have a moral formation. I remember this. Mm -hmm. There's a problem here. If the conscience is not a sure guide and it needs to be formed, then how do you ever know that it's in a place where it can be trusted? It's it's never, it's unhinged. It's, it's strictly then we're left with kind of a, um, always in need of yet more moral formation before we can actually trust our conscience. But the orthodox position on this is that conscience is not, doesn't need formation. It's speaking whether you want to believe it or not. It's working. Even little babies know better than to fight against their parents. 
any any parent will watch their their infant child, you know, like fighting them on one thing or another, and know that okay, well, there's the there's the inheritance of Adam working, right? And then then the child feels bad that it's behaving the way that it is, and then turns it it kind of like, mommy, I love you, kind of like. Could you still be my friend now? It's, the conscience is working in there and saying, you need to make it right. They're not thinking that. They're just experiencing it. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you have to be well in your teen years before you can actually think of that as a concept. That's the function of the conscience. It's a direction finder for righteousness. Mm. Now, it can be obliterated, and as we'll read when we look at the, I mean, it can be, it can be smothered, but it won't ever disappear totally. We'll, we'll, I'm going to share something from um, St. Dorotheos of Gaza in his catechesis. It's mentioned, the Berkeley mentions him, but I, I looked him up, and this, I, we need to, I need to share a little of that with you so you can feel our, I mean, he's as orthodox as it gets when it comes to um, experiential uh, orthodoxy. So even psychopaths and sociopaths have some degree yes. of caution still? Yes. And, and uh, on their very rare good hair days, they will admit it. Psychopathy, uh, socio-psychopathy is um, a complete addiction to the ego. It is an enslavement to the ego. Nothing else matters than pleasing the eye. It's a tyranny of ego. So the conscience is buried under the interests of the ego in your psychological language. Um, the, I, I have a question for you. Yes. So until I read this chapter, I always thought that the conscience is the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, no, I, yeah, I, I was surprised when I read that. I thought that that voice that we hear inside of us telling us what is right and wrong is the Holy Spirit. Well, the, and then uh, we, and inside, and then the people of the world call it conscious. But I see. Um, this could be a this could be a deal where you become so used to obeying. <clears throat> the voice of the Holy Spirit, that you can't tell the difference anymore between your conscience and the voice of God. One can come to that point where you don't feel the difference anymore. And that's, that's how God designed it. Mm -hmm. He wants to be so close to us that we feel him with us. He wants to have that kind of relationship with us. Well, St. Seraphim says we need the acquisition of the Holy Spirit, so it's not something we have automatically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all about acquiring the Holy Spirit. Well, how do we do that? So there's no difference anymore between our conscience and the Holy Spirit himself. If you obey your conscience. That's if we're living in strict obedience to our conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to like be the confessing person here, but I will do it just to be a lamb offered up Completely. I am keenly aware every day of those moments when I am not obeying my conscience. All those little things. He mentions the little things. Page um, um, 65. Yeah, Actually, um, he, he cites Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, 25-26. Um, that um, make um, make it right with your adversary mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, that is before you get to court, uh, because if you get to the court and it's not right, then the bailiff will, the judge will sentence you, and the bailiff will carry you off to prison, and you won't get out till you paid the very last cent. Yeah. That's speaking about the whole course of this life. Yeah. So let's make our consciences constantly saying, hey, fix this now before this goes any further, right? 
uh, the adversary is the conscience. Make peace with your adversary along the way. Before, Before the last judgment. judgment. Before the last judgment. Mm -hmm. And that along the way is our life, the extent of our life in this world. The whole idea is to make it right with our conscience mm -hmm. so that when we re get to court, if the matter is already settled, and we can mm -hmm. say to the judge, uh, our advocate will say, we settled out of court, we're good. Mm -hmm. And the judge will say, case closed, and then... And then you're free, right? But if we disobey our conscience by covering it, and he said, how important it is to obey our conscience in all the little matters. That's the little, really little. Uh, like for example, I'll confess something. So when I go over to the Euro Cafe in that direction, I really like their Americanos. It's the best. The best Americano in Claremont. Uh, but it's just not the same without half and half. <laughs> <laughs> and well, father, it's Lent. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I go in there, and I know how good it is. And my conscience is saying, it's Lent, dude. Mm -hmm. And I just get the pitcher, and I pour a cup in there. Mm -hmm. Just bam. Right in the face of my conscience. What does my conscience do? It just retreats. It's this faculty of our soul. There's so many things about it. It just like, it shuts up. It's like, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like your wife. And, and then every sip I took from that cup is pure hell. Like, what am I doing? This is Lent. Now... I hold off doing that until the last drop's drunk. <laughs> but just the same, it's a little thing. Somebody might say, that's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Enjoy your coffee, Father. You know? mm -hmm. But this is a little thing. This is where we actually work out our conscience. I pour a glass of wine um, on Friday night after the Akathis. You know, we, we, that's what we do at home. Fine. Uh, but wait a minute. Why are you picking the bottle up again? One glass is plenty. What are you doing? You know, my conscience is telling me, knock it off. It you know, is. this is uh, explored brilliantly in, in Shakespeare's Hamlet. He does the play within the play to show yes. the crime in front of the king, right? It's an exact uh, restaging of the murder. Okay. The play is the thing where in hell, uh, he'll, we'll catch the conscience the of the king. The thing. Yes. And the, and the king's furious because he sees his crime. And so Hamlet then knows that he's really guilty. And then later he gets on his knees because he wants to be free of the conscience, but he doesn't want to give up all. He, he doesn't repent. So he says, my words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. In other words, he's praying because he wants his conscience cleared, but he hasn't repented. It's brilliant. It's amazing. What a wonder man is. We play all these games with ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the conscience is infallible. It will never lie to us. No. St. Basil the Great says the conscience is a judge that cannot be bribed. Right. 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 But if I had to see any book, um, I don't want to derail this, but even as you're talking about little children fighting their parents and all of us learning obedience, Scripture says we learn obedience through the things we suffer. That's right. And most of the time, children will not actually turn around from their fighting even until they feel some discomfort. Yeah. And it That's feels right. like, I've been talking to my wife about this a lot lately, our culture has gotten to the point where consequences have been um, forbidden. You want to live on the street? Fine. Right. You want to use drugs? Fine. Right. You want to work? Speed, you want to run you want to shoplift? Fine. You want to shoplift? Fine. Yeah. You want to punch people? Fine. You want to, everything's fine. Everything's fine. There's no consequences. And I think it's really done. A number. Yeah. There's, there's no question about the damage that is done on a social level. It's, it's acute. There's no question about that. Because everybody, including the thugs on the street, know better. They're actually looking for the... the, the They're boundary. waiting to be corralled in and Restrain. They're screaming, restrain me. Right. 
I'm out of control. Where is the wall? Where's the boundary? Well, in the church, the church, of course, is the outward expression of the conscience of all of humanity. We have we have it expressed in the church. Only in the church do you hear the apostolic words with, that are confidently expressed regarding the truth of human existence. These are expressed without apology, with innocence. Right? All right. So... Um, I, want, I promised you um, Theropios of Gaza. Um, if you read Theropios, it's the third section um, on conscience, the third catechesis. Um, I'm going to read the first part that explains the creation of the conscience. Okay? And his words will give you just maybe even another kind of sense of the ultimate importance of this faculty of our soul. Unconscious. When God created man, he breathed into him something divine. As it were, a hot and bright spark added to reason. By the way, the word reason there is noose, mind. Added to mind which lit up the noose and showed him the difference between right and wrong. This is called the conscience, which is the law of his nature. This is compared to the well which Jacob dug, as the fathers say, and which the Philistines plugged up. That is, to this law of conscience adhered the patriarchs, and all the holy men of old before the written law and they were pleasing to God. Why? Because they obeyed their conscience. But when this law was buried and trodden underfoot by men through the onset of sin we needed a written law. We needed the holy prophets. We needed the instruction of our master, Jesus Christ, to reveal it and raise it up and bring to life, through the observance of the commandments, that buried spark. So does he mean now that the conscience is no longer working? No. But it does mean it's buried, and we can't feel it anymore. Um, are you aware of the 24-hour prayer of St. John Chrysostom, mm -hmm. I handed it out to you uh, as a card some time oh, yeah. ago. Yeah, I've got it. Um, I, I did, I, I worked on this prayer a lot because it was so meaningful to me. I wept as I prayed it. The fourth of the 24 hours, the 4 a.m. in the morning one, if you did it by each hour, reads this way. O Lord, redeem me from all necessity and ignorance and forgetfulness and sloth and stony insensibility. Anesthesia in Greek. Anesthesia. Insensibility. I'm numb. I can't feel anymore. That is a disease of the conscience that is purified almost instantly by repentance because immediately the conscience starts, free, it starts functioning again as soon as we pay attention to it. But we get the filth of the Philistines out of that and we, we, we plead with God for that to be cured. All of a sudden it's alive. God doesn't wait any time at all in enlivening, enlivening our conscience. It's the first and most important thing. That stony numbness, that spiritual deadness, that's a sign of great neglect. That's what he means here. It is in our power either to bury it again or if we obey it, to allow it to shine and illuminate us. When our conscience says to us, do this, and we despise it, and it speaks again, and we do not do it, but continue to despise it. At last we bury it, and it is no longer able to speak clearly to us from the depths where we have laid it. 
but like a lamp shining on a damaged mirror, it reflects things dimly and darkly, just as you cannot see the reflection of your face in muddy water. We are found unable to perceive what our conscience says to us, so that we think we have really even have hardly any conscience. It is this sentence that Archbishop Averke took in writing the chapter showing the current problem of, with our, our current world now. That people want to push the idea of conscience out of the way. This is an archaic concept. People don't want this anymore. Okay. No one is without a conscience, since it is something divinely implanted in us, as we've already said, and it can never be destroyed. It always patiently reminds us of our duties, but sometimes we do not perceive that we are despising it and treading it underfoot. This is why the prophet bewails Ephraim and says, Ephraim prevails against his adversary and treads down judgment. The adversary is the conscience. See, not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. When I'm sinning, my own conscience is my enemy. How many of you experience that? We've lived through that, haven't we? fighting ourselves to justify our stupid, idiotic, selfish behavior. We're fighting our own self when we do that. We knew it all along. We knew all along. We even maybe stood in front of the mirror and said, what are you doing, you stupid idiot? What are you doing? How many of you have had conversations like that with yourself? I mean, this is, that conscience is like, dude, I'm not going to shut up. When are you going to obey me? <laughs> right? <laughs> he goes on and says, So the gospel says, Come to an agreement with your adversary while you're on the way with him. Right? And he, uh, the archbishop told us this part so I can skip over it. Um, so, then he moves on to this point. Let us be zealous, brothers, to guard our conscience for as long as we are in this world and not to neglect its promptings in any little thing. Yeah. Yes. Let us not tread it underfoot, even in the least thing. For you can see that from the smallest things which of their nature are worth little, we come to despise the great things. So we, when we begin to say, what is it if I just say these few words that I know I shouldn't say? What does it matter if I eat this morsel? What difference if I poke my nose in here or there? <laughs> A man takes evil and bitter nourishment and begins presently to despise greater and more serious things and even to tread down his own conscience and so at last destroying it bit by bit he falls into danger and finally becomes completely impervious to the light of his conscience. Uh, there's a beautiful story about uh, the mother of Augustine. He's sharing it after he dies in his confessions. And, and he said, my mother liked drinking wine. And um, she would, when she was a girl, her mother would teach her not to drink too much water so that when she got to the age where she would drink wine, she would have the habit of restraint already built into her. It's a fascinating <coughs> idea. Uh, but Monica liked the Grenache, you know, and uh, so uh, every evening she would take a little, just a little bit from that, like a little cup and, you know, down it. Well, after a while, it was two cups, right? And then three cups. And by stages, she got to be quite the tippler, you know. Well, one day she got into an argument with her servant girl. And the servant girl called her a wine bibber. I use a, a, a very interesting old word that's kind of very insulting, but basically it says you, you're just a wine bibber. bibber. And um, uh, Monica's, uh, she could call her Saint Monica, by the way, Santa Monica. Right? <coughs> um, she, to her credit, she took that rebuke to heart and she, she examined herself and her conscience approved of that criticism from the circumstances. And she listened to her conscience. What are you talking about? 
Are you talking to me? Anyway, so Monica, uh, Augustine reports that his mother repented fervently mm -hmm. from that point and promised never to break that law again. Mm -hmm. And she kept to, to that for the rest of her life. And uh, there was a, a particular episode where when she came to Italy, they had a practice in Africa of uh, offering bread and wine at the graves of the martyrs. It was an earlier, it was a, a way to uh, commemorate the dead, especially the mar at the graves of the martyrs. Uh, but in Italy, especially under Ambrose, he didn't approve of it because if people would get drunk. They would, yeah. they would, they would just it turn into a over indulgent. Said no, don't do this at all. I don't approve of it. And she came there, um, and um, when she heard this doctrine, she immediately embraced it, even though it meant no wine. That told me a lot about her character, but. More importantly, it told me about how she found herself again. She got possession of herself because she obeyed her conscience mm -hmm. and how important that is. All right, he says, so don't neglect the little things. He said, really, there are no little things. This is mm -hmm. a thorough fix. He said, there really are no little things. For when it is a question of bad habits, it is a question of malignant ulcer. So let us live circumspectly, and he goes on and talks about it. Um, so then he says, there are three, um, three um, foci, if you will, uh, for the conscience to, um, that indicates to us. It has to do with God, um, our neighbors, our relationship with God, our relationship with our neighbor, and our relationship toward all creatures, or creation in general. So for um, God, he gives this example. Um, we must not despise God's precepts, even those concerning things which are not seen by men or those things for which one is not accountable to men. So for example, are you neglecting prayer? Your conscience is always talking to you about prayer. I'm prophesying to you. But it's easy for me to prophesy to you because it's a general truth that's always true. Mm -hmm. There's a 100% chance that I'm correct. Mm -hmm. I know that the conscience, your conscience is telling you to pray. I know the con my conscience is telling me to pray. Every time I get ready for bed, my conscience says, read the song or say this prayer, or recognize me, or make the sign of the cross. Every single time I go to bed, I do that. What can get in the way of that? Watching that last little YouTube clip. Um, um, being distracted by some other thing that just takes my mind off of, you know. I'm too tired. I'm just too tired. But am I too tired to actually bend the knee mm -hmm. and make the sign of the cross and say a six verse song? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not that tired because I'm certainly able to do a few chores before I go to bed and I'm certainly able to <laughs> indulge myself in one last stupid idiotic thing that I do. Yeah. Yeah. Like to stay up to find out what the score in a ball game was. That's mm -hmm. That's okay. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody back there said that that was okay. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Here's something. Sure, my confession. For an example, <laughs> um, he sees his neighbor saying something or doing something. Does he suspect it's evil and condemn him? My conscience says, don't condemn him. You don't know the facts. Mm -hmm. Just because you see something doesn't mean it's that way. Any, any detective, any lawyer, criminal lawyer, anybody who does uh, forensics knows that seeing is not exactly accurate. There's lots of things that look the way they look, but upon closer inspection, it can be very different. Uh, now going to the second of the three, and we're gonna end here shortly. In respect to our conscience toward our neighbor, that means we should do nothing 
that we think may trouble or harm our neighbor in deed, word, gesture, or even look. This is, of course, the expression Jesus says, do, not, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. All right? For there are gestures, as I very often like to tell you, this is a little personal thing for Dorotheos with his monks. You can feel that he's touching on something that he's talked to them a lot about. He's really riding them on this. Gestures. There are gestures which you can hurt your neighbor with, and there are looks capable of wounding your neighbor. And to speak plainly, whatever a man does readily, knowing it gives his neighbor a bad thought, he stains his own conscience because it means he is ready to harm or trouble his neighbor. And this is the sort of thing I mean by keeping a good conscience towards our neighbor. You know that idea of like the, somebody here in my life used to say, when I make an opinion, this person would say, well, any idiot knows that's not true. It's not me. <laughs> you will be held to account for every idle word. I didn't do that look today. is withering. That look is just withering. Any idiot knows that's not true. You know. This idiot did. Right. So when we're dealing with people, our neighbors, when we talk to them, when we interact, we must be very careful what passes over our face. We have to reprove ourselves and be careful to protect our neighbor from being injured by our weakness and reaction, maybe, to something they say. We have to excuse our neighbor for saying something that appears to us to be offensive and, and attribute to them a good spirit, a good will. They didn't mean it that way. They meant something positive. I just can't, couldn't hear it now. And maybe on further reflection, I won't hear it. But right now, I've got to excuse them. Right? And then the third, <clears throat> regarding a good conscience and respect to material things, not to use things badly, not to render things useless, not to leave things about. Uh, like, for example, if you borrow somebody's tools, Put them, clean them up, and put them back in good condition before you return them. Absolutely. How often in my life have I received loan things? They come back filthy and you know, not in good order. They say, thanks for letting me use this. But there was no sense of awareness, like, would you like to receive this back in this condition? And now I just keep that quiet, and I clean the tool up, and I put it all in good order and re-oil it. I mean, this kind of thing should op operate in our, as Christians. This is what we call good manners. It's amazing how when we obey our conscience, we become good-mannered people. Why? Because we're sensitive about the love of God and the love of neighbor as ourselves. In other words, it's a natural fulfillment of the great commandment when we obey our conscience. It's a, it's, it winds up being a natural fulfillment of that. He so says, we used to call courtesy, it's uh, dead. He, he has a, yes, we call it courtesy, but it's kind of higher even than that. Um, again, you can feel a little bit of Abadorotheos' uh, concern for the monks because they live in poverty. That means their monastic habits have to last a really long time. They can't just be replacing them every time. They, there's no Costco they can go to. <laughs> Get that. So he says this. Um, don't be slovenly about your clothes and wear them out too quickly. For example, when one can wear a shirt a week or two to want to wash it every day and so by constant washing wear it out too quickly and always asking for new. That's a very personal, I mean, very small detail, but it gives you a window into the care that they would have, right? Mm -hmm. So like my priestly vestments, I'm really careful about folding them because I want them to last the entire length of my life as a priest. Mm -hmm. They're expensive. It can cost over $1,000 for a vestment set. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a small budget. I take them out to a very trusted 
lady over in Laverne is very careful and respectful of my vestments. When I take them there, I show exactly what the problem is. And she take, I said, don't put, no water, don't, I don't need that, but I need you to, and, and when you've done, hang them, don't fold them, just hang them. Mm -hmm. You know, she's very obedient, and my vestments, I've been a priest for 20 years, I still have my ordination set, it's still in good repair. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a thing, but it's an important thing. And so, uh, in, my old, in my older age, um, I've gotten to the bad habit of putting things down, and so now I have to coach myself, don't put it down, put it away. And where is the away? It's the place where it belongs. Yes. And that way, when I go to look for it, I can find it where I expect to find it. Because if I don't find it where I expect to find it, dude, it's lost. Because where else can I go? Anyway, that was Dorotheos of Gaza on <coughs> conscience toward God, toward neighbor, and toward things. Don't waste, right? Uh, don't neglect prayer. Don't look crosswise at your neighbor. Those are little things, but they make everything. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, our Lenten series. And we'll pick it up later when we, when we come back to it. Any concluding thoughts or comments that you'd like to make as we're just halfway through this book? Has this been uh, inspiring? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes. In Alcoholics Anonymous, <clears throat> when we mentioned ego, you know, I, you know, when people live by their ego. It's E-G-E-O, edging God out. Mm. That's a nice little acrostic. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. Yes. Any other comments? Do you, do you want to keep doing this? Yes. Okay. yes. Should we revive yes. it after the yes. Apostle yes. Festival? Yes. 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 So we'll give it we'll give it a little bit of time because we have the Holy Week next week. We have the Renewal Week, uh, and we'll look at the calendar. I'll plug it in um, where it fits. Okay. And um, I'm thinking we can do it um, the second half up until Pentecost, and then we have the summer before us. Does that sound like a good plan? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Do you like it, Sophia? Yeah. Have you learned anything? Yeah. Good. 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 Catherine? Yeah. Especially your comment about putting things away instead of just letting them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, for me, putting things away is just throwing it into my closet. Say it again. Say it again. For me, putting things away is just throwing it into my closet. And closing the door quick before it rolls back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. O oh Lord and Master of my life, do not give me the spirit of sloth, meddling, lust of power, and idle talk, but give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant. Yea, O oh Lord and King, grant me to see my known sins and not to judge my brother, for thou art blessed and with great favors. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, our God, our Amen. 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 Thank you.